occupational function because they can also lead to medical illnesses. Uh, for example, if you become sexually promiscuous as a result of mental health problems, you can actually end up getting uh, illnesses like HIV. It can lead to experimenting of, with drugs and alcohol. Uh, sometimes patients may become hostile and aggressive and they can involve, get themselves involved in highly risky behaviors. Uh, mental health can actually lead to disability and death, especially suicide is a common cause of death in patients with mental health problems. When you don't take care of mental health problems, it can actually lead to mental illness or mental disorders. What do we mean by mental illness or mental disorders? When I talk about mental illness and mental disorders, I'm not classifying people. I'm actually classifying disorders. And there are quite a number of disorders, as we shall see. But in mental illness, when we refer to mental illness or mental disorders, we are referring to a wide range of conditions that affect the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. Our thoughts, our feelings, and our behavior is affected. And usually, we don't say that, that someone has a mental illness until the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act causes disturbance in our behavior, either socially, in terms of relating to other people, or occupationally, not being able to work. Uh, he, mental illness can actually result in distress, disability, uh, Important loss of freedom, it can lead to suffering, it can lead to death. And when we define mental illness, we are not talking about culturally sanctioned response to a particular event. For example, when someone loses a loved one, it's expected for them to go through a period of grief, a period of sadness, a period of bereavement. But when we, that exceeds beyond the expected time, or in addition to that, you have other behaviors as well, as well, then that's when we say, oh, possibly this person is having a mental illness. Mental health and mental illness actually exist on a continuum. At one point, you may have someone who has a diagnosis of serious mental illness, uh, but copes well with the daily challenges of life, is able to work, is able to be productive. That person has positive mental health, even if they may be having a diagnosis of serious mental illness. Then you may find a person who does not have any diagnosable illness, but they're in poor mental health. So that's where we say mental health and mental illness are actually exist on a continuum. What are some of the signs and symptoms of severe mental illness? I decided to classify some of them in terms of feelings, thoughts, and behavior. And uh, it's important for me to mention that it's not just one symptom that makes someone, that makes you say that someone has a mental illness. Usually we have a group of signs and symptoms together, and these ones actually uh, affect someone's social and occupational functioning. Examples of feelings that people will have when they have mental illness. One, excessive sadness. Sometimes it's excessive anger or irritability. People may have increased suspiciousness, thinking people are following them, they want to harm them, they want to poison them, they, are, they want to malice them. And sometimes it may not be easy for people, other people to understand why someone becomes suspicious, but it can be a, a, a sign of mental illness. Then excessive happiness or elation, energy, feeling special on top of the world, you know, as if everything is now okay, it can be a sign of mental illness. But as I said, not just one sign. This can occur together with other symptoms before you make a diagnosis. Some people become overly anxious, worried, fearful, and that can be a result of mental illness. Then others may have indifference or diminished abnormal emotional expression. Uh, something that's supposed to make them sad or cry may not as you would expect. Some of them may actually have uh, kind of inappropriate feelings. They are talking about something funny, but they are crying at the same time. Or talking about something sad, but you know, they are laughing at the same time. So such inappropriate expression of emotion can occur in mental illness. Others may have recurrent thoughts of death, or in the, at the extreme, even homicidal ideas, thinking of killing others. There are many reasons why someone may do that. And many times it's because of the mental illness. Then of course, there's low self-esteem and high self-esteem. 
The thoughts of people with mental illness vary. Some may be slow, depending on whether someone is depressed or not. Sometimes the thoughts are unconnected. You can't follow what someone is saying. Sometimes the thoughts are just fast and racing, many ideas running in someone's mind and you just can't follow. Some people have obsessions where they think, you know, something, recurrent thoughts occurring to them over and over again and they can't control them. There's also what we call delusions. These are abnormal beliefs that are not true. They are not keeping in someone's religious, economical or social background. I gave an example of feeling suspicious. Other people will feel like, you know, they are being poisoned. They will not eat food at home because they think, you know, someone is putting poison in their food. They want to prepare their own food. They may feel as if they are being followed. They may feel special or have special powers and abilities. Uh, we've had people coming to us and thinking, you know, they are great prophets. They are destined to advise statesmen of important thi things. Well, we've had people have been caught like in state house because they believe they, they have a message for the president and they actually go to the president's, uh, they go to the state house because they know they will be allowed. They are definitely the special. They have a special message. But when all this is in their mind, it's really not true. Some people feel like they are being controlled. Their actions, their movements, I'm not the one doing this, someone is controlling me. Or they may feel as if uh, there is interference with their private thoughts. All of us have private thoughts and many times you don't want people to know some of your private thoughts. But when people become mentally ill, sometimes they will they will think that their private thoughts are aware, are, 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 are present, other people know them. Then the behavior, behavior may be disorganized, you know, some people collecting rubbish, moving around, aimless movements, abnormal postures, they may stand in one place for a long period of time, some may be just restless, agitated, others may be slowed down, depending on what mental illness we are talking about. They may isolate themselves, they may withdraw, withdraw from activities, from other people, from work, there's lots of interest in the activities even someone who is usually would attend church would stop attending church or fellowships because they believe now everything is meaningless sometimes they see the future hopeless they have a sense of helpless helplessness a sense of worthlessness can occur depending on the type of mental illness that you're talking about changes in relationship is another aggressive and violent behavior may occur when someone has a mental illness and it may occur for many reasons maybe they are hearing voices maybe they think you are going to harm them so in a way let me harm myself before you actually do harm to me i remember one patient who came to butavika and had cut his throat and was hearing voices so it's like ah, before these people take me i better take myself so that's what, the reason why he cut his throat other people cut i mean uh, commit violent acts for many other reasons Risk ventures, there are people who take part in risk ventures, business ventures because of mental illness. They have a lot of plans and ideas. They think everything is going to be successful. Then overspending, partying, indiscreet sexual behavior may occur as a result of mental illness. Of course, uh, the changes in thought are reflected in the changes in speech, which may be uncoordinated, incoherent. They may use new words. They may be slow or they may be talking fast. Sometimes people say things that are not there, what we call perception without stimuli or hallucinations, like hearing voices. This could be commanding in nature. They could be discussing the patients among themselves. Sometimes you see a patient talking to themselves, but it's because inwardly they are actually hearing voices and they are responding to these voices. Sometimes they may act on them, seeing Harriet, visions or things. Yes. I had it. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, please. Please, please maximize the screen. Just max maximize the screen, the PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Uh, is it maximized at the moment? I thought it was. I will want you to go to presenter view to slideshow. So click on the slideshow. Icon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh god there's just something small preventing me from slideshow 
that I, I had carry not carried on in the interest okay. of time. Okay. I'm so sorry, should have. Uh, okay, changes in awareness can occur. For example, forgetfulness. We have people with dementia who present with forgetfulness. Initially, they are just forgetful about simple things, like where have I put my money, where have I put my wallet, where have I... But eventually, they may become severe, I mean, very forgetful, to the extent of even forgetting their own children, their own partners, especially in the elderly who have dementia. Sleep changes are common. Appetite changes are common. You may have oversleeping, you may have lack of sleep, increase the energy, increase sexual energy or libido, changes in menstruation periods may occur. I'm calling that as some of the biological changes that may occur as a result of mental illness. Uh, then there's what we call lack of insight. Many times people with very severe mental illness are unaware that they are unwell. It's the people who are staying with them who will actually see that this person is really unwell and yet for them, they don't think they are unwell. So that is actually very common, especially with severe mental illness. With common mental illness, the next slide, I'm so sorry that I'm sure people are not seeing what, I, what I'm talking about. But anyway, the next slide talks about common mental disorders. Uh, we are actually seeing the slide, so I'll proceed. Okay, uh, some common mental disorders include depression, anxiety disorders. Some people have panic attacks, excessive fear, which, you know, episodes of excessive fear, breathing very fast, and they cannot explain what is causing the excessive fear. Sometimes they end up going to the hospital thinking they have a heart attack or they have an asthmatic attack. Then, of course, some people may have excessive fears, unrealistic fears about situations, what we call phobias. And then we have also what we call trauma or stress-related disorders. Then, of course, other patients present with severe mental illness, like severe depression, bipolar disorders, schizophrenia, dementia. Those are just a few examples. Other people present with alcohol and drug-related uh, alcohol and drug-related disorders. Uh, the other thing, the other disorder I wanted to mention is epilepsy. Epilepsy is normally not a psychiatric illness. It's really a neurological illness. But patients with epilepsy can present with psychiatric symptoms. And uh, also, there are many types of epilepsy. Uh, usually, people present with seizures, convulsions, foaming, tongue biting, incontinence, and loss of awareness. Uh, epilepsy is one of the disorders where people think uh, that probably these are demons that are responsible. Uh, because of also we have examples in the Bible. Now, when it comes to causes of mental illness, uh, before I go to the causes, it's important to emphasize that actually you don't make a diagnosis based on only one symptom. You must have a group of symptoms together before you say that this is a mental illness. What are the causes of mental illness? It's been suggested most of the severe mental illnesses I'm talking about Unfortunately, we are not very sure of the causes, but we know that there's an interaction between biological, psychological, and social factors or environmental factors. Initially, that has been the general saying. Uh, for now, scholars have actually justified that it's important for this model of healthcare, of mental illness, to include the spiritual model. So, biopsychosocial spiritual model. Is, uh, can explain some of the causes of mental illness. And uh, in WHO, I already gave that definition, where health in 1948 was defined as a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, and not merely absence of disease. Uh, in 1999, there was a modification to include uh, spiritual, the spiritual dimension as well. But of course, uh, it has not been widely taken, though increasingly spiritual dimensions are being recognized for clinical purposes. Uh, the biopsychosocial model tells us that there are different causes of mental illness. 
Uh, the biological causes could include genetic vulnerability, for example, it may run in the family. And illnesses like bipolar, illnesses like depression, even schizophrenia, I'm talking about severe mental illness, they actually do run in the family. But we also notice that actually there are changes in the neurochemistry, changes in the structure of the brain, changes in the function or metabolism of the brain, and it can contribute to mental illness. Other illnesses, infections like HIV, nutritional factors like thiamine deficiencies, cancers. I remember one time I had a patient and uh, I mean, when we did a brain scan, we actually found that they, this boy had a, a brain tumor and yet the behavior was that of a person with severe mental illness. Um, brain injury or trauma. And then of course, drugs and alcohol, some effects of diet and lifestyle, socially, some people, for example, begin using alcohol as a result of peer influence, work-related stress, school-related stress, financial stress, cultural factors, family circumstances like divorce, separations can contribute to mental illnesses. Trauma like sexual abuse, rape, defilement, or physical abuse can actually lead to trauma. Then, of course, the attitudes we have may influence uh, our mental health, the beliefs that we have may influence our mental health. Uh, the social skills we have, if we have uh, inept coping skills, we can actually end up having mental health problems. So these factors interact together, the biological, the social, and the psychological factors. Uh, it's important for me to mention as well that when you see, though this model here doesn't include the spiritual aspects, but you realize that things like self-esteem, your spirituality may influence that, your attitudes and beliefs, coping skills. It's been re increasingly recognized that actually religion and spirituality can help us to cope, not only with mental illness, but with severe, men severe physical illnesses, like a diagnosis of HIV, a diagnosis of cancer. Someone may cope well, depending on their religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs. I wanted to show this slide on uh, something about the biology. Uh, that's part of the brain, it's cut, but it's a model. It's not exactly what the brain looks like. But you see those connections. There are connections between different parts of the brain. And those connections are called neurons. And the neurons receive message and also send out messages. So they can control our behavior, our motor functioning. They can control vision, the sensations that we have, what we hear, what we see. It's a... Uh, that model explains that there are actually connections between the brain. Now, when you come to disorders, like for example, depression, in the, the connections between these brains, you'll find that they are junctions. These junctions are called synapses. And you will find that, for example, in some of the depressed patients, they are neurotransmitters or chemicals within these junctions that are affected. Of course, it's not as simple as that. There are other changes in receptors, enzymes, and uh, other uh, changes, which I will not go into the details, but they show that actually mental illness has biological explanations as well. And that's why we give drugs. We've realized that the drugs we give causes these neurochemical changes and eventually someone is able to improve because the chemical imbalance is restored. What are some of the common beliefs that we have about mental illness? Uh, yes. You are yes. going to be moving towards the close. Uh, you have okay. very, very few minutes remaining, like two or three, kindly. Yeah. So many times people think that mental health problems are an excuse for bad behavior. Uh, like, why can't someone just stop taking drugs? We usually know that actually the brains get rewired when someone is actually using drugs. Initially, what begins as voluntary drug use ends up being compulsive drug use. Other common beliefs that we have, mental health problems are always caused by demons, witchcraft, and ancestral spirits. I'm not an expert in that, but there are various factors that contribute to mental health illness, as including spiritual factors, but there are also biological, psychological, and, and environmental factors. Sometimes we feel it's not a real illness, you can snap out of it, you know, it's a character weakness, some people think that mental illnesses are not common. Mental health problems do not affect young people. 
we believe that me mentally ill people are violent and aggressive. Not all the time. People are more violent to the mentally ill than they are themselves. Mm -hmm. Majority of uh, mentally ill people are not violent. Some people believe that Christians are not affected by mental illnesses. But I'm not saying that uh, examples of people who are really have mental illness, but we have people who wished they were dead, who wished that, you know, God could take them, like Jonah, Elijah. Some people believe mental illness is a punishment from sin, for, for your sin. Yes, that is possible, but it's not always the case. Some people say, you know, just surrender your mental illness. God is testing your faith. You are a disappointment to God. There are many factors that can contribute. Some people think mentally ill people cannot work. They don't recover. Asking for help is a sign of weakness. Mental health problems are not treatable. Psychiatric medications are bad. Uh, but they are, there's treatment that we have found useful. Uh, psychotherapy, counseling, even electrical shock therapy or electroconvulsive therapy uh, is useful. There are many professionals who can help, including spiritual leaders, psychiatrists. Some people think they can't do anything for a person with mental health problems. You can definitely help. You can reach out and be present and let the other person know that you can help. Don't take lack of interest or refusal by a mentally ill person personally. It's because of what is going on in their mind. Learn to share facts about mental illness. The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So when you have knowledge, you are armed. We don't treat people with mental illness with respect. We discriminate them. We judge them. We stigmatize them. We call them names. And yet we know, even the Bible encourages us, who are we to judge others? Why do you say that someone has a curse? or someone has seen when you are not even very sure whether that is what is happening. And then we label them mad, mulalu, mawaya. You know, uh, it's very, it can be a problem. But we can support them, avail them with material, financial services, home care. Sometimes it's a burden looking after someone who is mentally ill, but you can share the caregiver burden. You can visit someone who is mentally ill. We have patients in Butavika who are never visited at all by relatives until you know you get them to discharge them. No one is caring for them. Pray for them. Sometimes they may not be able to understand. You may not have to pray with them, but you can pray for them. Help them to access services. Link them to care, okay? Specialized care. Uh, like in Uganda, all the national referral hospitals have psychiatric units. Butavika, Mulago, Chirudu, Naguru, regional referral hospitals, government hospitals, private hospitals. And of course, it's important to emphasize that spiritual care is important. In conclusion, mental health is everybody's concern, and therefore it's important to talk about mental health. Just like our bodies, our minds can also become well. And if you are unwell, get help early if things don't feel right, just like you would for our physical illness. And it's important for us to help those with mental health problems. Thank you so much for initiating this conversation. Uh, I think that's all that I had prepared. Thank you very much, uh, Harriet. Um, the way you ended a uh, very helpful um, mental illness is, not, is a normal illness. Um, but you know, growing up, um, the language, even the language we used, I grew up with terrible, terrible language, mad, mad, mad. And I think one of the, uh, the fears, um, so uh, mental illness is, is a normal illness. Uh, people, we suffer from malaria, we suffer from cancer, diabetes. Uh, we suffer as human beings from mental illness. So uh, thank you very, very much for uh, bring us this uh, scientific and uh, really, really amazed to, to see this. We are going to uh, shift gears to Dr. Goreka Okahawa. Uh, she's going to uh, now take us to the whole area of therapy uh, and uh, the various ways in which uh, this can be. So over to you, uh, Dr. Goreka Okahawa, please go ahead. Thank you, Uncle Zach. Um, I would also request to be able to share my screen. May I? Am I able to?
May I share my screen? Yes, please go ahead and share your screen. Harriet, please um, unshare your screen so that Goreka uh, uh, can start, can do hers. Harriet, are you still there? Yes, I am. Yes, if you can uh, unshare your screen so that uh, Goreka can. Uh, oh, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, okay. Not a problem. Can I? Please proceed. Yes. Okay. Am I, can you see the screen now? Yes, we can, thank you very much. Okay, so um, Uncle Zach said I was going to speak about support, counseling, therapy. Uh, Dr. Harriet has touched a bit on it. And uh, so I will focus on mood disorders and the therapy that is available. For many of, of uh, the different disorders, uh, the, you, so when, when you come as a client to a psychiatrist, a, a clinical psychologist, or a, a counselor, an assessment will usually be done. And according to the assessment, they will choose, they will select the, the kind of therapy that would best work for you. So in preparing this, I was thinking, I was focusing mainly on mood disorders, depression, and, and uh, the related disorders. But as we go through it, you'll see that for, uh, some of the, the therapies, the theories that are used in dealing with, with the mood disorders can be used for other, other things as well. Um, you see that some of what is on the slide has already been done, with, so I will not spend a lot of time going through it. So this is um, treatment of mood disorders. Harriet talks about medications. At the moment, in Uganda, counselors and clinical psychologists are not licensed to give medication. So we work closely together with the psychiatrists to, to, for them to give the medication. And in some cases, as counselors, you will receive clients that are, if you think of the continuum, are more severe than we can actually deal with them as counselors. And they would need the um, the intervention of medication before you can actually sit down and talk with them and use the different therapies. So that would be the first, the first line. What's happening? What is? Can you see the red colors? What is happening? No yeah, worries. I we can read the text. So go ahead. I don't know what was happening. Anyway, um, so. Medications are, that are preserved of either psychiatrists, uh, doctors, physicians. She, uh, Dr. Harriet mentioned electroconvulsive therapy, which is in use. In the past, it was something that people feared that they thought would, it would be uh, maybe detrimental to the, to the client's health, the patient's health, but now it has been improved and it is used and it, it can be effective. Then uh, maybe focusing more on the psychological treatment, uh, two of the common, uh, common therapies that are used, especially with mood disorders, are cognitive behavior therapy and interpersonal therapy. Now, in cognitive behavior therapy, uh, a, a psychologist, uh, a therapist will be trying to identify, challenge, and replace unrealistic automatic thoughts and underlying assumptions. So as an individual, when you decide to do something, you usually have a reason why you decided to do it. And if you think about the way you make decisions, something happens, you think about it, you analyze it, you interpret it, then you decide what you want, what you, you, you're going to do. And uh, all of that about what is going to happen. In cases when people are depressed, there's usually 
unrealistic automatic thoughts that come up or underlying assumptions that continue to fuel the depression. So that therapist would be targeting those assumptions that are negative, that keep on telling someone they are, they are worthless, they are, they are making wrong decisions, they can never do anything wrong. Then uh, things like negative self-talk, irrational attitudes, uh, selective attention, just paying attention only to what reinforces the idea that they are helpless, they are hopeless, they, they, nothing can ever change. Um, then there's also teaching social skills, problem solving, conflict management, stress reduction, and, uh, and just personal management. So all of that would be included in cogn cognitive behavioral therapy as we work with people who are depressed. Um, then when it comes to bipolar, which is also a depressive disorder, but has the extremes of, uh, and Harriet mentioned this as well, the extreme of manic, manic behavior where someone is elated, is very happy, is spending all that they have, thinks they're on top of the world, and then in a while they go down to the depths and they feel like nothing can go right. They, are, they, they, they stay in their room, lock themselves in, they do not want to talk to anyone. In, in the cases of bipolar, you use a, we would use a combination of cognitive behavior therapy and interpersonal therapy. Now the interpersonal therapy focuses more on what is going on in the individual's interpersonal relationships, uh, helping them to to reinforce cognitive uh, coping strategies in their relationships to strengthen the, those relationships. Then there's also family therapy. Um, very often, people who are having um, me, um, poor mental health, their, their families do not understand what is going on. And very often, we don't understand. We feel maybe someone is just behaving badly, is just making poor decisions, and we fail to see what is going on. So family therapy can help when the whole family, or at least the people who are closest in the family can come together and discuss what is going on. Usually the therapist, the therapist explains what is going on, what they should expect, and how they can support, uh, support the, the client who is uh, going through this, this difficult time. Then very often cognitive and interpersonal are combined in addition to the medication. And this doesn't happen only for um, mood disorders, as I, as I said. Uh, there are a number of other counseling theories, counseling therapies uh, that would be recommended depending on the specific, on the specific challenge a client is having. Now, um, I would like to, before I go into the rest of the the rest of the presentation, I'd like to focus a little bit on building resilience. So the whole idea of support is to build resilience. And um, I mentioned that mental health is on a continuum. At one end, you would see, you'd see people who are, they seem to be well, they seem to be managing and they are able to to maintain their, 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 their relationships, able to do the work that they need to do. And at the extreme end are those who are so ill that they need to be hospitalized. Now, um, we, most of us who are functioning well, who are going on with our jobs, will fit into the lower end of the, of, the, of the continuum. But if we do not put in the time, the effort, to maintain our mental health, to reinforce it, we could easily move further along the continuum to more severe issues in mental health. So there are, um, one of the things that has come up that has been reinforced from studies uh, in, with depressive clients and other mental health problems is the importance of resilience. Being able to build that, it's like that, build the inner strength within individuals to be able to know what is going on inside them and ask for help when they need it. So looking at this diagram, you can see we, they, it, is, it is thought about in the different dimensions. There's a psychological dimension, biological dimension, social cultural dimension, and a social dimension. But really all of them come together to help individuals maintain their emotional equi equilibrium, cope with stress and hardship, uh, face adversity with strength, and recover from trauma. And this can be done through the psychology. We just talked about uh, therapies and, uh, and, and uh, theories. 
In Uganda, we are st as, as counselors and uh, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists, we are still struggling to, to make um, voluntary seeking of mental health services, especially for people who are not ill, not, not severely ill. We are still struggling to make it known, to make it acceptable. Very many people still think that if I go to a counselor, if I go to a psychiatrist uh, or a clinical psychologist, I must be sick. I must be really having problems. But we realize that some of the things that were taught uh, by parents by, uh, in uh, maybe primary school, basic coping skills, basic social life skills are not being taught anymore. So you meet someone at the level of the university and uh, their relationship, they, they don't even know how to build a good relationship. They, they can't tell when a relationship is bad or good. Or they, they so there, there are some things that used to be done that are not done anymore, that now you will have to seek out professionals who have learned how to do it to be able to provide you with the, with the, with the skills. Um, so things under the psychology dimension, which would come easily under counseling, developing a positive outlook, um, nurturing gratitude among people, coping and problem solving skills, mindfulness, cognitive flexibility, emotional regulation, meaning and purpose in life, and the perceived personal control. How much does someone think they actually determine or they, they can decide what to do with their lives? Um, so a lot of that can come under counseling. In some places, um, for example, at UCU, some uh, training has been done to, to equip peers to help their peers. So you will find that within the student population, there are, few, there are some people who have been trained to provide some of these services. So you, you may be able to find it within the population, but in, in many cases, you'd have to actually consult a counselor, a social worker, a, a professional to provide these, uh, these particular skills. Um, so the social dimension is increasing, mainly increasing social, support, social supports. If you think about um, what the whole world is going through right now, when we, the emphasis is on social distancing, it kind of um, suggests the opposite of in, in, a, in, a, in a situation where you would have very easily run to someone uh, to talk to them or about a problem that you have. Now you're being told, keep your distance. Um, in the days of the complete lockdown, you're not even able to go visit the people who you would normally uh, engage with every day. So the idea of social support is very important in building resilience. Connection with significant others, meaningful social relations, the ability to seek help from others, the sense of belonging, community involvement, and understanding the power of media messages. As you realize that the, the pandemic has, has, it's like an attack on all this whole dimension. So as we think, how are we helping ourselves? How are we helping other people, especially during this time? That is one area where we have to find ways on, of, uh, this is one way, and being able to come together, everybody's in their home, but be, being able to connect is one way that we have gotten around it. But that's a big part of building resilience, being able to facilitate the social, the social support. And then um, the biological dimension, some people have a genetic vulnerability to mental, mental illness, men, uh, mental, uh, mental disorders, and, and uh, some of the things that we've been talking about. So if that is, um, if, if that is noticed, if that is seen, Usually, I mean, one of the things we ask as counselors when clients come in is about the history, about the psychiatric, the family history, the psychiatric history. Is there anyone in the in the immediate family, in the extended family that has had a similar problem or has had any other uh, disorders? And there are some particular disorders uh, in, uh, for which, if someone in the immediate family has already suffered from it, it's highly like more likely that the, the individual will be suffering from it. So if that is the notice, then um, the psychiatrist that you, you pay greater attention to the, that area than uh, thinking it's just maybe uh, one of uh, something. When avoiding uh, harmful substances, cigarettes, um, drugs, other, other, other things like that, consuming a healthy diet, very often we don't think of the diet as contributing to our mental health. But if you think of uh, if someone just 
it's junk food and it's junk food. Your energy is reduced. Your ability to think as fast as you, you would want or you need to may, may, may not be as, um, as, as, as fast as it, as it should be. Um, keeping fit, you realize that when you are fit, when you feel fit, you, you feel better about yourself. So if you're, if you're not, um, if, if you're not, um, uh, just a minute, uh, should, I be, should I be the one admitting people that someone have the right to admit? Because it keeps coming up, up on my screen. Just ignore that. Uh, we'll, we'll take uh, that. Okay, okay. Um, so, um, minimizing exposure to environmental toxins and uh, maintaining physical safety. So thinking about exercise, about diet, about safety, about all of these combined together to, to, to reinforce good mental health. And if all of them are lacking, then it will, you will, it will move you further along the continuum to poor mental health. In a psycho, psycho social culture dimension, if you think about our institutions, about our communities, spirituality and religion, uh, in many studies it has, it has been shown that people who are religious People who uh, have a, a, a active uh, a, a play an active part in their religious communities have better mental health. So now, uh, just like we said earlier, we have been deprived of the opportunity to meet as we would usually do to fellowship, to have Bible study, to see people who um, reinforce our, our hope uh, every single time. So what are we doing to kind of compensate for this? Because it's a big part of. Uh, of building resilience, being able to be part of those communities that reinforce our faith and, and uh, our connection to other people. Um, cultural group ident identification and cultural integration. People who feel like they don't belong um, may sometimes have poor mental health because you, you go this way and uh, you don't fit, you go that way, you don't fit. Um, examples are children born of inter- Interracial, interracial marriages. You go to one side, especially black and white, or you go to one side and you don't exactly fit. You go to the other side, so they, they many times they have to work harder than than normal to than than would be expected to fit in or to to have to maintain um, a good mental health. So the the idea behind the support behind counseling would be to build up this resilience especially for those who are still within the normal part of the continuum. If we are strengthening all of this, then we expect that people will get better, will, will, will continue to improve their mental health, and will be reinforcing the mental health of those around them. For those who are already in the more severe, more severe part of the continuum where they, have, they are already experiencing uh, disorders, like I said earlier, we may need to first medicate if it's already severe and then do actual psychotherapy to help them get to the point when some of them will be able to die and they can be, they can actually uh, help improve what, what is going on. So that is one part. Let's come to a conclusion uh, so that we can uh, invite the other, uh, finally move towards a conclusion. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the things that came to mind as I was preparing this was the very strong link between depression and um, depression and suicide. And um, I, like my time is almost up, so I'm not going to go into great detail. But you'll have uh, I'm going to make this this uh, this uh, PowerPoint available, so you'll be able to look at the the different ideas that I, I had prepared for, in particular about depression and suicide. Um, one of the things that we do as counselors when people come in with depression is do a suicidal assessment. We ask whether people are having suicidal thoughts, whether they intend to commit suicide, whether they have the plans to, co uh, to actually go through with it. And if they have already attempted, we try to find out the intent behind what was done. Now, some people are afraid that if you ask some of these questions, you introduce the idea into someone's mind that, um, of it being an option. But this is rarely the case. People who have actually considered suicide will have thought about it over and over again before they even come to answer these questions. And um, 
those who do not, we, it, it will not be, it, it won't be like you're in, introducing, introducing any new ideas or about suicide into their minds. Um, so what do we do? How do we help? Uh, we, um, Andrew at the, at the beginning mentioned that incidents of people who are actually burning themselves because, uh, because of, or maybe it's depression, but this is a form of suicide, a form of protest that results in, uh, in, uh, in death. What are the protective fa factors against suicide? There's a strong motivation to live. People who have a broad perspective on life, people who are socially connected, like I just mentioned, strong connections with family, with school, with friends, and then people with coping skills, being able to say, oh, this is difficult for me. Let me reach out to somebody. Let me find someone who can help me. And uh, some uh, in, an interesting idea that I came across, but that is very true, is being the uh, people who practice gratitude, being, um, being able to look at yourself and realize that so much has been put into your life, so much has been contributed by other people, and living a life of gratitude. And then, very, also very important, being able to identify personal strength, their own personal strength, and being able to use them. So when you are in trouble, being able to say, I can do this, or I can find help in a, in a different place. Um, children and adolescents, uh, uh, so if, if this is the last thing I, I, I end with, um, children during this time have been, if those who are, who are at school are using the internet. And one of the studies that have come out recently, uh, and especially in the West, is that child and adolescent suicides are very often triggered by bullying, by cyber bullying. Children are going online, and uh, whether it's people they know, school circles, uh, friends they know, or other people who just see the posts, who are able to access their posts, begin bullying them over the internet. So they post things that, um, negative things about what they look like, what they have said, and that kind of thing. There have been instances where children, teenagers especially, have been abused. Like maybe they go out for a school, a school party or food out with friends, and uh, there's a particular uh, story I read of a girl, 15 year old, who went out with some friends, two two other teenagers, and she was supposedly gang raped by these two, and they videotaped the whole thing, and then they posted it on her page, where I mean, where everybody could see it. So she goes and and she was drugged, so she didn't. She didn't know what had gone on, so she goes onto her page and she sees all that had happened. So she got to the point where she, she went, uh, at, to which she was so depressed because everybody, everybody could see what was what had happened, and there was no. And it was her. It was clear that it was her, but she didn't even know anything about it. So she committed suicide to get away from 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 uh, the shame the, and the guilt of being part of it. So one of the things, even as we go into e-learning, um, expose our children more to the internet and is being aware if, if there's any bullying going on, if there's any, any kind of abuse that is coming through the internet. The other thing with the internet is that there are instructions available on exactly what to do to commit suicide. So, and children have used some of them. So the bullying may come in the form of you're use, useless, you're worthless, why don't you commit suicide? Why don't you just go away with yourself? And, that, and then they give links to places on, on the net where these instructions are. You can mix this and mix that, or you can do this and do that, and children go ahead and commit suicide because they have been bullied to the point where they can't, uh, where they think they can't, um, they can't take it but also they, are, they know they, they have been given information on what to do. So that is one of the things we need to be aware of as we continue with this wide, widespread access of our children to the internet and, and, um, and other things that come with, with uh, e-learning. Um, for, for children, again, one of the things that happens if they, are, if they experience the suicide of a significant other is they ask themselves, why wasn't, wasn't I enough, if it's a parent, why wasn't I enough for him or her? So the question is, how could 
my parents, my father, my mother, my grandparents, how come I was not enough to prevent them from going through the suicide? And these are feelings, these are beliefs about the individual that can go on even later in life. So you see someone who doesn't think much about themselves, but it's because they have the thought that I myself as an individual was not enough, I was not maybe I was not good enough, I was not significant enough to the other person for them to, to prevent them from, from killing themselves. Of course it is difficult to deal with suicide after it happens. Uh, nobody can explain it fully because the person who could have told you, I, this is the reason, has, has gone. And uh, so especially for, for children, a lot of support is needed for them to be able to build the the skills that they need to deal with to deal with the challenges it will be difficult it is very difficult because there's a limit which you cannot explain but for them to be able to grow in their own personal strengths be able to see themselves as someone worthy even though someone else that was connected to them um, has passed away due to due to suicide um, other things that happen when when uh, uh, suicide happens is that people try to understand it and make meaning of it. And sometimes this changes the way they think, the way they think about relationships, the way they think about trust, about love, about all kinds of things because they think, I thought I believed this, I thought this, but it has changed. And then some people develop risky behavior, they begin to think, ah, if, if that could happen, then I, I might as well go do what I, what I want to do, what, what use is it. So it's important to get support at this, at this stage um, because even though it has happened, the person left behind can be supported to, to do something with their life, to be able to, 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 to flourish, to continue to grow and to not to follow in the, in the, same, in the, in the same, same footsteps. Um, so some people are very uncomfortable talking with depression or talking about depression and suicide and think, no, it can never happen to me. I am successful, I'm doing well, I am. But we know that there was a statistic I read that men are a fact about um, from research that especially men, some of them who commit suicide have, have not been diagnosed with a, another disorder. They haven't talked about it. They haven't even experienced a lot of suicidal ideation, but they get to a point where they realize we really decide, no, this is enough for me. So if you yourself are going through depression and you, it, it has even crossed your mind, maybe it would be better day, that would be better. These are some things that I would say to you. Promise yourself not to do anything rash, anything now, like anything about it right now. You will know that suicide is an irreversible solution for a temporary problem. After you've done it, that's it. So the first thing, the only thing, the most thing you should do is promise yourself, I won't do anything about it. Let me, let me think about it. Let me avoid using alcohol and drugs. Make your environment safe or get to a safe environment. Um, for many people in the developed countries, we don't have like guns, loaded guns close by. So even when you'll be so upset, so to the point where you can say, ah, let me pick up something and that may not be readily available to you. So. If, it, if you know that, if you have maybe weapon, something that you can use, get rid of it, get into a safe environment, remember there is hope and talk to somebody. Um, Uncle Zach earlier said they, they, they are, they, they are, if you link up with the people who are, are able to provide you with the services or link up with Andrew or whoever, Dr. Ryuka, they can give you contact. Harriet is there. I am there. The number of counselors that are willing to talk talk you through at least until the, up to the point where you can begin to see life again, begin to enjoy your life. If it's someone else, start a conversation so that they can share their feelings. It's very important for an individual who's going through that to be able to share what is going on. It's like you, you're being pressed down, a load is pressing down on you, and once you share it, it, the Lord lifts and we're able to see, okay, this is another, another day. I live to see another day. I, I be, the, 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 it's like the perspective widens. You, suicide comes because someone has gotten to the point where they think it is so bad, this is the only option open to me. But when you're able to talk to someone which you can trust, it helps lift that load. Then if 
you are the person who has been trusted with that confidence, listen calmly, without judgment, empathically, the, the first reaction will be to, to think, what? You're also thinking about it. But it is not that common for people to get to a point where they think, ah, ah this is useless, this is... So listen and help them seek help. Don't leave them um, without any help. Don't leave them without any pointers. Help them get professional help uh, so that at least you, you, you will, you, the, the, the professional can carry on from, from that point. Um, I think Thank I'll stop. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goreka Okahabwa. Uh, we deeply appreciate. I'm sure that uh, we all appreciate that um, we are trying to uh, squeeze so much in uh, a very, very large, very broad, very deep subject. But so we really want to appreciate our presenters for doing everything they can to say so much in such a little time. So thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. Okahabwa. This is. Uh, you know one thing that you you talked about um and i've been i've been thinking myself about language we are using about social distancing and, and i've actually come to the conclusion myself that this language is not helping us this is a time when we need to be more socially connected uh, but maybe when people speak about social distancing we are actually talking about physical distancing so maybe let's talk more about physical distancing and be more committed to be socially connected because you can see the impact of being socially distanced, uh, how that itself contributes. Uh, yes, yes, let's commit ourselves to be more socially connected even during this time. Um, building resilience, uh, so much that you have said uh, that's extremely helpful. Um, the dangers of the web, my goodness. Um, well, these presentations will be available uh, for any who would like them. Uh, if you can uh, uh, send a chat to Andrew Mujugira or Emmanuel Yurika or uh, the General Secretary of Focus, then we will make sure that, uh, and then give them your email. Uh, for those on the Focus chat room, those on the Baraza by the Fire uh, chat group, uh, both chat groups of Interface and Focus, uh, these will be available to you uh, on your chat groups. Uh, but otherwise, if you'd like um, uh, this presentations, please send a chat uh, with your email address to either uh, Dr. Andrew Mujugira or uh, Dr. Emmanuel Yilika uh, or the Focus General Secretary. Yes, let's talk more about physical distancing rather than social distancing. I am very persuaded about this. Well, it's time to uh, bring in our dear brother, uh, Pastor Michael Chaze. Uh, we have, as you have followed, um, all the dimensions of this. Uh, one of the things, uh, uh, Pastor Michael, that people who have asked these questions are really interested in understanding is how do you discern whether something is as a result of demonic uh, oppression, demonic possession, or uh, other spirits, ancestral spirits. How do we discern that? Uh, I really do hope that you can help us answer that question uh, because it's been a, a very big question, among the other things that I'm sure uh, you're going to be able to say to us. Well, welcome to Pastor Michael Chaze. Pastor Michael Chaze is the senior pastor at Omega Healing and uh, a man that God has used over the years uh, in uh, preaching the gospel as an advocate for the right thing, social justice. So welcome, uh, Pastor Michael Chaze. Um, thank you, Zach. Um, thank you for having me to this meeting. Um, those were quite good presentations from my sisters. And they are quite mind popping. And I believe, I believe we have picked a lot. Mine is simple. Uh, simple in presentation, but um, we are dealing with a very delicate problem, delicate situation of mental health. Um, my past is um, a past of uh, an aspiring scientist who did um, some biology and chemistry, but as I was growing up, uh, he also developed 
conditions which were spiritual, but I did not know. Conditions which involved hearing of voices, seeing of beings. I would be seated in a class and I would bet someone has walked through the class. And um, then I received complications where I would fall. Sometimes I would fall. And I'm walking, I find myself uh, tripping and fall. It's not tripping, just falling. And uh, my mom got concerned and took me to many doctors. I would fall sick when going to class, be well outside the classroom and um, trying to explain my situation. Doctors, doctors, some doctors say to mommy that Michael just doesn't like going to school. And um, falling often, like passing out, was related to my height, that I'm not having a good blood supply to my, to my brain, so I have to rise slowly then eventually walk, eat good breakfast. It was understandable what the doctors were trying to do, trying to understand my situation as a young person. Then when I turned 18, that's when I met for the first time a preacher who believed that my situation needed deliverance. And um, he prayed for me and um, it took a week and he broke, he broke what I was battling with. Now, for me as a pastor, after listening to what my sisters were saying, I want to, to, to focus on what I've seen mainly as my dilemma and to moments of challenge when I try to analyze situations of mental health which I meet more often in my, in my service to my people. Recently, I attended a course in counseling um, where we were dealing with biblical or Christian counseling, which is referred to as nothetic counseling. And the main textbook was um, written by J. Adams, who wrote a simple book called Competent to Counsel, it's a leading guide to those. It's a leading guide to those who are doing biblical counseling and reformed theologians. Uh, what amazed me in his presentation, Adams said that um, the first person with mental health challenges was Adam himself, and uh, Adam has mental health because in their perception they believe that if you lose the mind of Christ you have lost the mind. You have lost your mind and the best way to begin counseling is to restore a person to Christ. When a person does not have the mind of Christ is already opened to do and to many mental mental uh, disorders. So in authority counseling, the counseling begins with putting a person right with Christ. And um, the main text, of course, would suggest that every person needs to be exposed to the word of God to maintain the proper mental health. And every person needs doctrine, needs correction, needs admonishing and training to avoid mental challenges which would come their way. Now, for, for me, two words become clear in the whole process. Discerning, how do I know this is a demonic situation or and testing? Again, discerning and testing. Discerning, I'll say discerning would be having the ability to judge right, though in the spirit we think that discerning may be a spiritual issue, which may not begin with information, but also the inner feeling of a person to know whether they are relating 
all interacting with the right information, all people. So testing can be done as one of my sisters was saying that they can take you through a series of tests and questions to know whether you are going through or having symptoms of, of mental disorder. Now, the challenge for us as Christians is we war not after flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers, and powers of darkness. Actually, what that means is that our real enemy is unseen and is real. So Satan is real. Satan is unseen. And the other point we learn from him, he does not enter by the door, he enters by the other ways. And so he works incognito. We also know that he has been in his business for more than 6,000 years. And that's a lot of experience for dealing with human beings. If you look at the word temptation itself, temptation means that a person is caught in a moment when he is being enticed by an unseen force through his mind to work against his own will. Paul would define it as the flesh in Romans chapter 7. And we know that temptation in Genesis 1 comes with the serpent. Serpent there may, is a physical being which also is being in, in which has been um, in, inhabited by a non-sin force to bring temptation. But in Luke chapter 4, we see Christ being tempted and the serpent is not brought in that picture. So a person who engages in thought would wonder what was Jesus going through in the wilderness? Was he talking to someone or a voice was talking within him? People who have read Luke chapter 4 imagine that Christ was in the wilderness and the temptation, all the voices that were talking to him ended in the wilderness. But a good look at the book of Luke, we see Jesus not only being tempted by voice, but being moved to an extent that we, he goes into... Um, Hello? He moves, Jesus moves and goes even on the temple, the steep of the temple. Some would like to say, am I still on? You are. Yes, you are. Continue. Yeah, the yes, you're on. You're still on. Okay, thank you, Danny. Um, the, the, there are other voices it's coming to me. Please kindly proceed. Hello? Uh, you are still on. Proceed. Continue. Yeah, what Jesus is going through in Luke chapter 4, and uh, it's open to discussion. Luke chapter 4 begins in the wilderness and ends on a steeple in Jerusalem. Some people say that was all mental and it wasn't real. But then the real understanding, if Jesus was tempted to jump from the temple, which was suicidal, and um, then it wouldn't have been a temptation if he was jumping mentally. So we need to understand the, reali the reality of voices that talk to our people and how they can deal with them to overcome them. I hope I'm being understood there. So temptation brings an unseen party speaking to a person and pushing them to do what they do not will to do. And in uh, talking to our people who are having challenges, it is sometimes intensified temptations which are coupled with visions which are sometimes uh, filled with things which they may not understand, but pushing them to work against their own will. So it becomes a hard ball to play when you do not know what's going on. Is it purely the person's mind or Satan has hacked, if I may use the word, and is speaking through a person? We see the Jesus experience, we see the experience of, um, of Adam, we see in, in Matthew chapter 12, 43, 
how a unclean spirit comes into a person and the state of that person is worse. And when the unclean spirit is cast out, it goes, but the house has to be swept and put in order, which I believe is retraining, refocusing, rehabilitating a person who has gone through a spiritual attack. And if the person is found not ready, the next attack is even worse. And all this is attributed to spirits which come and make life impossible. That does not rule out the fact that our people have their personal problems, but in the Bible we see that our sins open us up to spiritual attacks. And I'm trying to be as stereotyped as possible to widen space for, for discussion. Now, how do we understand Satan um, and healing? I, I have prayed for many people to go through mild spiritual attacks and I've encountered people who have had deep spiritual attacks, demonic attacks, visions, things talking to them. And I, I want to admit that I have met some problems which I've not been able to, to deal with. In the Bible, we have experiences which are almost the same, but require different attention. When you look in the Bible, you can find blind people. There are about maybe four blind people. You find that group of two blind people in Matthew 20, who Jesus just says, touches and they see. Then you find Bartimaeus. Again, Bartimaeus, he, he calls out to Jesus and Jesus just tells him, see, and he sees. But then you find the man of Bethsaida who is brought to Jesus for healing. And they ask Jesus to touch him. But Jesus knows that this blindness, he will take more than a touch. And he walks him out of the city of Bethsaida touches his eyes and he says to him, what do you see? He says, I see trees, gives him a second touch. Then he receives total sight. Then there's another one he meets in John 9, 6, 7. He, this is a man he, who was blind and he, he spits, mm, mingles dirt and puts it on his eyes and sends him to the pool of Siloam for healing. So different cases of mental health, using that analogy, may require us to do something a little bit more than what may we did with the last person we, we met, because different cases come with different requirements. And I sometimes think that we as pastors think that it's a matter of just raising hands and praying but sometimes it may require something like a separation, like a man of Bethsaida taking him out of the city and probably a process, a first touch and a second touch. And remember, he finalizes that, finalizes that healing by telling him not to go back to that city. But it doesn't rule out the fact that the challenge could have been sorted out physically. The Bible shows many things which happened and um, you can easily label them to be physical or even, let me say scientific, but may have a spiritual story behind them. Again, looking at the story of Job, Job's situation in Job chapter one, verse one to, for, sorry, verse 13, we see how Job's life is broken with attack of the Sabians, who are a tribe which was more of cattle wrestlers who come and wrestle and take away his donkeys, his cows. And then we see lightning striking and killing his, 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 his flock. And you see wind coming and blowing on his house and killing his children. And again, you see the Chaldeans coming and rooting his things. And, um, 
and look at that scenario in Job chapter 113 can be easily explained. For the wind, I would advise, I would advise Job to plant windbreakers. For the Sabians, maybe I would tell him to have more security around his property. For the lightning, maybe I would advise him to have earth wires around. Uh, for the Chaldeans, another tribe, probably security and insurance. But reading earlier passages of scripture, you would see behind all that catastrophe, it was Satan at work. And when he left the presence of God, he worked behind elements. He worked behind things which seemed innocent to destroy the life of Job. So even a mental illness, which can be detected hormonically of all through hormones and neurons, may have an author which is spiritual behind. So um, my, gen my conclusion would be that whatever is happening mentally to our people, we should not rule out the fact that some of our people need, um, need serious spiritual ministry and it may be aided by other medications and other professional treatments but we should not rule out the fact that the enemy is at work behind all this. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to say that this is a very big topic, but for a Christian, you should not rule out the fact that under every device, every setting, you are dealing with an unseen force. Um, I was worried when I went to Butabika uh, when I go to Butabika and walk through the corridors and how all those mentally, uh, most of the mentally challenged people yell out to me, hi pastor, how a pastor, about a group of 10 shouting and cheering you, others coming to you. I was worried uh, about the mental health of Christians in church and whether we are handling it right. May God bless you. Thank you for giving me time to share. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Michael. Um, my goodness, you've uh, uh, tickled our minds as well around the study of the scriptures. To be very honest, I'd never had anybody uh, speak to the temptations of Jesus the way you have. I'm going to go back and read. Uh, the way you have uh, read Job. Um, so you've, uh, there is a lot to do. And I think what you are really challenging us to now look to the scriptures, uh, I think Harriet had uh, mentioned uh, some of the um, amazing people who evidently uh, had mental challenges uh, that are there in the scriptures. So maybe coming to the scriptures uh, with this uh, uh, um, uh, lens, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, mental health. And the point that you make uh, that um, uh, any of us disconnected with the mind of Christ, uh, anyone, any one of us. So I guess it's all of us uh, because don't we all have moments when we are disconnected with the mind of Christ? Even those of us who are in Christ uh, sometimes. So we all are vulnerable to it. So it's not just the mental health of our people, it's, the mental, it's our mental health uh, and how all of these are connected, uh, so we really, really uh, do appreciate. This is the time now for um, our questions, uh, Q and A. We again realize that um, we don't, we have limited time. Uh, we are hoping that this conversation will continue uh, on maybe some specific aspects uh, of this. Uh, so don't have the frustration that we are not able to deal with everything. Uh, I have already promised that um, uh, we will be able to share the. Uh, slides, uh, the presentations, and uh, again, please be sure to get in touch with uh, 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 Andrew and, uh, and, and, and Emmanuel uh, on this, and the General Secretary. So let's again uh, be reminded, you can post your questions uh, on the uh, chat group. You can also put up your hand, and uh, between me and Emmanuel, we recognize you uh, so that we are able to to then uh, have a Q and A. You only have about a minute to put your question. Uh, please don't uh, uh, do uh, presentations. Uh, put your question. It's question. It's it's a time for questions. 
Uh, we deeply appreciate our three presenters. So uh, no speech uh, of appreciation. They know we appreciate them very much in order for us to make the most uh, of our time. Uh, Pastor Chaze, what are your thoughts uh, on African spirituality in regards to mental health? What role can that play? Very quickly, Michael, as we get to other questions. What do you mean by African spirituality? Because um, our spirituality can be good. Uh, the fact is that our background gives us an awareness that there is a spiritual world. And that's a plus in its own right. Trying to suffocate the, the reality of the spiritual world is exposing yourself to, uh, to, to ignorance. And that ignorance will lead to bondage. Spiritual, spirituality of an African is a plus. It, it helps you know, appreciate that I'm facing things which are beyond my physical reality. That's an answer. Am I right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, spot on. Uh, yes. Uh, so feel free to direct your questions to any of them. Uh, Andrew, you had your hand up. Uh, thank you, Zach, for, for that. A couple of questions came up in the chat. One of them was, where do people find resources if you have someone at home that needs a counselor to visit them, or you have a, a spouse you're worried about that may be mentally ill? How do you uh, get those resources? The second one would be that probably the, one of the biggest barriers to access to health is stigma. Stigma is so pervasive and is even worse in the Christian community. How would we address stigma? Thank you. Uh Dr. Okahabwa, do you want to just give us a run on uh, the different uh, levels? I think you did, uh, but again, refresh us. Are you still there? Yes, yes. Um, so um, the extreme disorders would need a psychiatrist. So if you see someone has, uh, and, and Harriet mentioned it, loss of insight, they're not aware, completely aware of what is going on. Maybe they are violent. At that point, it would be to the psychiatrist first, the psychiatrist medicates, and then they can either do psychotherapy or pass, um, refer the client on, the patient on to a psychologist or a counselor to do uh, continuing support of psychotherapy. Um, we talked about the lower part of the continuum. There, there you could contact a counselor or a clinical psychologist and they'll work with you at the point at which you're at. But if it's more severe, you need psychiatry. Okay, I think one thing we can commit to various groups, uh, particularly on the two groups, uh, the Baraza by the Fire group of interface and the Focus uh, group, uh, we will be able to uh, put there a list of uh, counseling psychologists that we trust and clinical psychologists. And of course, we now have our dear sister, um, Harriet, who is at the Republic uh, Mental Hospital to support us, to give us more info. Harriet, do you want to add your thoughts on resources and uh, places to go, uh, as well as responding to the question of stigma? And I know that, Harriet, uh, this is not just a story for the public. You yourself, uh, I mean, I did share my own story dealing with this in my own family. and. I think it would be good, uh, good people for us to share stories. Pastor Michael Chaz, you've been awesome. Thank you very, very much for sharing your story. So Harriet, feel free to uh, be able to uh, uh, respond. Yeah, about resources, Harriet, I think, yeah, yes, please. Uh, about resources, we've talked about different people who can actually help. And uh, one of the things we found out is that uh, most of the patients who come to Butavika, over 80% or who visit mental health specialists, 80% first seek treatment from uh, pastors, church leaders, or other spiritual leaders, or even uh, 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 traditional healers before they come to the hospital. Uh, there are some studies that have been done that actually show that uh, not so many in terms of the churches, which we, we need to do, but uh, traditional healers. We have some PhD students who did uh, studies among the traditional healers with just a few pastors, and they found that actually 
there are some things that these people help in uh, treatment with, yeah. Uh, yeah. especially the, the mild mental health problems. Uh, so the resources are many uh, in terms of looking at our spiritual leaders, in terms of May counselors, in terms of clinical psychiatrists, psychiatrists, psychiatric clinical officers, mental health nurses. So all those are, are, are resources. And I mentioned in my presentation, hospitals, nearby health centers. Most people come to Utavika, and in Utavika we can actually be overwhelmed. We have more than 100% of our bed capacity. But regional referral hospitals have mental health specialists. District hospitals also have some mental health specialists. And all medical people are trained to be able to handle at least the common and the simple kind of mental illness. So you can even go to your general doctor as a beginning point. You don't have to come to Utavika. You can go to a regional referral hospital. There are 13 of them in, in the country. Chirudu, Naguru, they also have specialists at the moment. So those are the resources that are available. And then uh, the issue of stigma is a major, major, a major issue. Harriet, uh, just a moment, Harriet. Just a moment, Harriet, because um, I, I have spoken to, and I did say, uh, my dear friend, uh, David, um, with whom we were in Terry School, and uh, Michael, you might want to come back to this. Uh, there yes. is actually evidence that sometimes um, uh, uh, pastors themselves have become a problem uh, one of the things, when especially you prescribe deliverance and on and on, and people are taken through those sessions. I have met many uh, people who uh, the medical specialists have diagnosed as bipolar, but the Christian community has held them back. It's demonic and so on. And so some people have actually been hurt more by pastors and so on and the church, uh, not just because of stigma, we'll come back to that, but because of this whole question of this discernment. Uh, recognizing that it's it's the demonic and so on. Can you can you speak to that? Uh, uh, because although you speak about pastors being a resource, uh, Harriet, uh, there is a lot of cry that pastors actually also become a problem because for everything they see, they pre they prescribe uh, deliverance and and demonic oppression and spirits and so on. Michael, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, uh, Zach. Um, it, um, thank you for the opportunity. I think sometimes it's unfair when people descend on pastors and blame them for some mental situations which have not been sorted. A bulk of people who are sick uh, also go through, through medical, seek medical attentions and they also do not get the healing they need and they get some prescriptions which totally knock out the patient, they salvate, they are only sleeping, so if that is a, 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 a way to say that you are sorting out a problem, it's not a sorting out as well. So we both cause different sets of problems. Some prescribe medication, which is not actually helping their patients, and they keep, it, keep them on it for long until some of them come to pastors and we advise them to limit the dosage and add on counseling and social events and prayer and we have helped many in that direction. But the problem is when pastors sometimes think that the way I healed the other blind, sorry, the other, the other mentally cha challenged person is the way this one will be healed. I put him on chains and pray for him day and night. Yet when Jesus was approaching his challenges, he needed personal, personal guidance. Each situation was handled in a different way. Going to church, singing, lifting hands is not enough. And sometimes meeting the pastor and praying for you is not enough. It may need the presence of the pastor to be with you. There is a situation I dealt with and I tell you, I had to, to, to chain up this person, be with him for more than a month until lastly, I broke through. So we need to know that all of us are going taking people through a process. Sometimes our ministry is not done right, but we all error. And we need to learn to refer, refer our patients to one another for help, for help. I don't know whether I'm responding to that. 
Yeah. Yeah. None of us should blame the other because we are, we are all causing problems on our sides. And I can list it. <laughs> the medical people thank are really Thank you very much, Michael. Support. Thank you, thank you. Let's not play the blame game. Uh, we, yeah. we all try where we can. But I think what yeah. you are saying is that um, a, a greater personal attention. I think your, your point about the way Jesus treats every situation differently is, is powerful for us who are pastors and to think differently. And um, uh, that's really helpful. Can we address the question of stigma? Uh, uh, Harriet, uh, do you want to start there? But also or maybe uh, uh, Pastor Michael, the question of stigma uh, on mentally ill people uh, in our churches. Uh, it's so difficult for a person to, to just open up and say, I have had a depression in the church because immediately uh, this fear that um, people yeah. therefore say, have you seen uh, the kind of stigma around mental, uh, mental challenges, yeah. mental illness. But uh, first of all, Harriet, do you want to speak to that? I think stigma is a big issue because you, we actually have, you can have two different types of stigma the internalized and then the external stigma. Uh, you yourself, when you've had a mental illness, I mean, coming out in the public to tell people that, you know, I've had a mental health challenge uh, can be a, quite of a, a challenge because it changes the way people look at you and then they feel mm. like they cannot trust you. It's worse when you say, I've ever been to Davik. Uh, usually I get people who want help from me but when I tell them, you know, can you come to Butavika? And they're like, at least we can see you from somewhere else. It can't be Butavika because everyone will think that we'll never recover again. I think knowledge is one of the things that helps us, that arms us to help to be able to deal with stigma. When we have the knowledge that actually mental illness can be caused by a number of other factors, there are physical illnesses that may be involved, like HIV, brain tumors, injuries, neurochemical disturbance. In that way, if we are able to understand that and have knowledge, then we are able to know that I mean, you can talk about mental illness. Uh, uh, you can then talk about uh, uh, mental illness. Uh, stigma is, is quite a big issue. Uh, coming out can be quite of a, a problem. I've experienced this myself, and sometimes you're like, okay, if I say I have a mental problem, what will people think of me? I've ever had this, I've ever had a depression, I've ever had this. I mean, and, uh, I mean you get stigmatized, and it becomes very, very difficult to, 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 to come out. One of the stories I like is of uh, Rick Warren, they lost a son, I think, Rick Wallen, the author of The Purpose Driven Life. They, they yeah. lost a son of, from um, suicide. And they came out and they were able to say, you know, yeah, this is what happened. Our, our son, Matthew, killed himself and has been struggling with mental illness for a long period of time. And what they did is that actually they go out in churches and talk about, they've opened a support group, they've opened uh, an association that talks about mental health. And that's where we, we really need to go. Yes, our drugs have challenges. Uh, they have side effects. Sometimes it's weight gain, sleeping, but also uh, they can also be very, very helpful. I've seen this, I've experienced this. And uh, many people, you'll find that actually when someone has voices, for example, and they are really, really disturbing voices, even when you try to talk to them, you don't talk to them at the same wavelength. We've had people come to us saying, you know, I'm Jesus Christ, I'm Elijah. And this is definitely not true. And sometimes, when, even before they've gone through any kind of uh, counseling, and they are very aggressive and they are very violent, you give them medicines, and then they come down, and then they tell you, eh, for sure, I think that was wrong. There was something wrong with me. Uh, I've kept on in this profession because I've seen it also useful. I'm not saying that deliverance is not useful. I think uh, it has its own place, but I've also seen that uh, mental health, dealing with drugs and psychotherapy is also very useful. 
there are so many debates about mental health and uh, and uh, and uh, psychiat I mean mental health and demons and psychiat and the healing of Jesus. One of the most interesting books I've re ever read is about uh, it's called uh, Jesus the Village Psychiatrist, and this person actually believes that uh, most of the illnesses that Jesus the, the, the healed were actually they could be explained in psychiatric uh, terminology as we understand it. So the debates are many, but maybe we should also think that there are many things that we will never understand. Like the Bible says in Deuteronomy 29, there are some secret things that belong to the Lord and we'll never understand it. I think what we need to do as Christians, as spiritual leaders, is to be able to work together. Where the science beat us is that they have evidence which they document and then they are able to say this works, this doesn't work. Uh, the reason why I prescribe medication is that I've seen it work, but I've also seen evidence uh, that, uh, I mean, people tell you, you give this medicine, these are the side effects it's going to give, and you notice that actually someone is going to become sleepy, you notice that someone is going to gain weight, they are going to have serious side effects. You talk about them, but then you balance the benefits and the, and the risks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Harriet, yeah. I'll stop you there. Um, and uh, I don't know whether, Pastor Chaz, you want to speak something about a stigma, but maybe the, the basic thing is, are we finding it difficult to accept that mental illness, mental challenges are normal? Isn't that maybe why, maybe Michael, uh, when you said uh, the whole, uh, the mind of Christ, uh, and I think earlier on, um, Harriet spoke about uh, sin. Uh, how do we get to a place where everyone of us, pastors, bishops, clergy, uh, born again, spirits, you know, filled, to admit that mental challenges are normal because we are human beings. Uh, we disconnect with Christ, we sin, we, and yes, uh, we human bodies. Uh, is there something here that uh, maybe, because somebody asks a question here uh, that is challenged uh, when he sees a born again person who has served in the church and then eventually gets mental illness. And he says, it gets very tricky to explain to non-believers and maybe that itself is an expression of stigma to suggest that somebody who is born again may not have a mental health challenge is to suggest that isn't that put a stigma itself on mental illness. We have never said that somebody who is born again will not suffer from malaria. We have never said that somebody who is born again will not suffer from cancer. Mm. Hey, Michael. Yeah, I think we need, that's a very valid point. We need to, uh, to come to a point of believing and uh, that mental health is more, more, what would I use? It's more abundant than any other disease in its different dimensions. It may be shallow or mild, and in some cases, deep and complicated. But all of us get those moments where you would say that was a moment of mental challenge. In, a in, in dimensions. I like what Jay Adams says, that, you know, sin itself does not leave us the same. And all have sinned, and if all have sinned and deviated from the mind of God, then mental health is a universal challenge. Now, about stigma, I think the challenge is, uh, I don't know how we can ever rephrase, like, how can we change the hospital of Butabika for another name that we stop saying that they went to Butabika and we say they went to maybe a recreation or whatever, something. It's like it has to be purposefully. We need to start changing the name Butabika because the original, the original understanding of what Butabika means, means you have gone to a place where you are mentally retarded, mentally affected for life. Well, you are mad. So I think, I think just, you are mad. That's, that's how we grew up thinking. You yeah, are so, mad, and yes. so you need to go to Butabika. So if we can remove the name Butabika, probably for Uganda, can begin healing some of the stigma. In church, when, <clears throat> when people come to church and they are mentally attacked,
I think church is very, very easy because we, we, we attribute the problem to the devil. <laughs> we don't say it is yours. We saw your stun, it is the devil doing that. But the problem also is we cannot deal with some human challenges without dealing with the sin that causes it to come. So in most cases, through counseling, approaching counseling, not in a Rogerian way of seeking who did you this or who harmed you in the past, but dealing with your heart situation and trying to help walk you out of what you did through repentance has always been, if done right, a very curative and very successful approach. I strongly believe that most people, if they can trace what they need to repent of, it always brings quick healing to the mind. But maybe that's the point, uh, uh, Michael, and uh, just to again uh, uh, keep this, you say in churches we say it is Satan uh, uh, and therefore that gives us a sense of safety, but maybe not actually because who wants to be associated with Satan? Who wants to be <laughs> who wants to, <laughs> who wants you to know, be in church and be told? Know, so anyway, I'm just, I'm just being able to say, suck. maybe the point you make about language uh, itself, uh, and I think you made a very strong point on how yeah. we need to uh, adjust our language. Zach, the way we present the gospel, we try to create a, a, what, a safety bubble where the devil does not reach. People who are devil free and people who are attacked by the devil. But the Bible doesn't come out that way. We are all tempted, which means once in a while, the devil talks to us okay, in different degrees. That can be theological. If, if you talk about temptation, then it cannot be you tempting yourself. There must be another factor bringing temptation. And by the Bible, that's the spirit. Thank you, thank you. And I think that different dimensions. Uh, the point you make that mental illness is more prevalent, maybe more than malaria. Uh, Emmanuel, do you yeah. have some questions you have seen that need to be put to our panelists to be brought to our attention? Emmanuel yes, or Andrew? there are some questions on the chat. Um, Can you read one or two of them? Okay, there is uh, somebody who uh, made a comment. Uh, Thanks, Pastor Chazel, for pointing out that mental illness is more prevalent than malaria. My professor of psychiatry, Professor Bosa, used to say jokingly that all of us were mentally challenged, only the degree varied. That came from Dr. Watit. It's not a question, but a comment. Most of the others on the chat are really comments. Um, um, and then there's another one about um, uh, having an active network between churches and psychiatrists and counselors. That comes from a same way. Maybe we can say a bit more about that since we have each of those uh, institutions represented, how can they work better together? Churches, uh, psychiatrists, and counselors. Yeah, I think I can stop there for the, for the moment. I think somebody also uh, wonders, uh, I think there are many comments which I think we all can read. Um, uh, uh, the issues around uh, one purported psychiatric sharing a video, declaring a patient he took his life because he's bipolar, yet they have never met. I think the, the whole carelessness that goes around, and especially WhatsApp and uh, videos, I think the point was made, uh, how we need to find ways in which uh, we are protecting our children or informing them, maybe not protecting, but uh, educating our children on um, how to uh, utilize uh, the internet. Uh, I think that has been made uh, very significant. Uh, Somebody is asking about ancestral worship, uh, bullying in schools, naming our children by our descendants, um, and uh, and uh, and does that naming children by the descendants does that mean passing on a spirit? Uh, again, I think that, that these are deep issues. We may not be able to uh, respond to all of them. 
uh, but it does say that uh, we need to read the, the Bible uh, in a fresh way. Uh, any of the panelists wanting to make a comment on any of these? Yeah, Zach, I would like to say the submissions by my sisters have been amazing. I've loved the way Harriet has really expounded on the scientific view of the challenges we encounter. How I wish I was equally prepared with that, for to meet that with an equivalent. But um, I think we need to come to a point of realizing that we are not enemies of one another, but we need to complement one another because we are dealing with something which is monstrous and shapeless. And it is devouring our people even after this, even during this uh, COVID-19 COVID season, we see many challenges, panic attacks, depressions, which have increased. And I think we need to complement one another. We need to know how can I refer people to Harriet? How can Harriet refer people to me? How do we help one another? Because we do not seem to have all, all of us to have the final solutions to our challenge. Thank you very much. A very important point. Somebody here is asking, how do you persuade a friend or a relative who needs treatment uh, for mental health to seek treatment and counseling? Uh, Goreka, do you want to respond to that? How do you persuade a friend, a relative, a family member who needs uh, attention uh, to seek help and counseling? Uh, I think there are yes, many of us who have been afraid and, and they see our friends who are going through something that, uh, as you both have explained, uh, you and Harriet, uh, the evidence is there. So how do we move from being afraid to uh, really being able to help somebody to seek for help? Uh, yeah. So for, for some people, and this is where the cooperation between the doc, the maybe the physicians and the psycho, psychologists or psychiatrists comes in. For some people, they will better receive it from a medical doctor to recommend additional help. If someone has a problem and you, and you help them see a doctor, a physician, you can talk beforehand with a, with a physician or if they are able to see the problem. If they refer the client, the patient to a, a, another professional, a counselor, a psychologist. Many people will receive that better than you, who is not a professional, telling them, oh, you have a problem, let's go and see a counselor. So that might be one way you deal with it. Help them get to a medical person, a, a physician, a, a doctor, and discuss the problem with the doctor. Yeah, but uh, uh, Goreka, Goreka, mm -hmm. just uh, you remember, the you, you notice in your family, I notice for my Pardon? friends, Mm -hmm. If I notice my friend, my family member, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm with them, um, they are not presenting any directly a way that would would even make them believe that it's okay for them to go and see a doctor. Because mm -hmm. if I say, go and see a doctor, they say, but I'm not, there's nothing wrong with me. So, um, so it's, I think that what the person is asking is at the basic level, at those, uh, if the thing has not become uh, uh, excessive, but the evidence, as you've shared with mm -hmm. us, is there. How do I, uh, who is there, uh, how do we find ways in which, as a family member, uh, I, I help this person seek help? Because you see, if you say to me, tell them to go and see a doctor, uh, maybe that's, that sounds too radical. Uh, maybe they are not, they will oh. say, but I'm not, I'm not sick. Okay, so th that would work um, if it was more serious than, I just see a few things. If the person is already manifesting some serious symptoms, but they insist they, they are, there's not a problem, at that point they could be willing to see a doctor. At the very beginning, it might help for you to, you yourself to get some information that you can bring up maybe in discussion, in uh, if it, uh, something like this helps, people have gotten information that they may not have had beforehand, so they can bring it up in a discussion, they can talk about it and uh, help the other person to understand. But the other part of it is, for many of these disorders, one of the major symptoms is lack of awareness and lack of insight. So whatever you say as a brother, sister, parent, they will not listen because as far as they are concerned, they don't see a problem. So that it would need 
maybe a, the professional to explain to them or to work with them. It, it becomes yeah, so very tricky. So, yes. Thank you. That's very helpful. I think what you're saying is that we ourselves need to deepen our knowledge and awareness. And maybe that's where people are asking, what are some of the basic things we can read? But anyway, one of the reasons for this session, uh, colleagues, mm -hmm. friends, brothers, sisters, uh, friends, wherever you are from, is to give us some deeper information awareness. And as mm -hmm. I said, uh, these slides will be presented. And uh, maybe at a point, uh, our brother, Michael, would also prepare this presentation. Because Michael, we're going to be asking you uh, to speak again. So you're going to prepare a presentation that can be shared. But Michael, you want to say something. Let me just say to people, we are moving towards concluding this uh, uh, webinar uh, because we did promise uh, ending at 10, 10, 15. So we are moving to finishing uh, and uh, because we can't finish the subject and people need to go to do their other work. Uh, but Michael, do you have a very quick comment? No, just a simple comment that about the referral. When someone wants to, you would like to take someone to, to see a doctor, the, the chain of reference can also include a pastor, a spiritual leader. If you want to, to, to refer someone to the hospital, why don't you say, well, let us go and see the pastor about this? And you talk to the pastor that, you know, pastor, this person needs help. This has been the history, but we would like to finally end up in hospital. And the pastor can help you direct that person to, to the doctor work with you to take your person to the hospital. That can help mm. in reference. Mm. Referral, Thank that's you. it. Absolutely. Mm. Because people find pastors safe. Um, uh, and I guess the other thing that you're saying, uh, Michael, which I think we all really need to deal with, is how do churches become safe spaces? How do we turn churches becoming places of stigma, but safe places where people can share their whatever challenge they have. And, and of course, the first place to admit that we all um, uh, have one form or the other of mental illness, mental challenge, therefore uh, we need help. Uh, Janet says, I have never had a sermon on mental health in church. Can pastors begin to preach about this subject as part of the challenges we face uh, so that people can be helped? Uh, now, many of you go to churches, uh, so please talk to your pastors about uh, uh, summons on mental health. Uh, it's unlikely that there are enough pastors on this uh, chat group. So you're going to be the ambassadors to say to your pastors, hey pastors, can you speak to us about mental health? And maybe they can then invite uh, professionals in the church uh, in the various angles. This kind of conversation, I think needs to be encouraged. I we have are to winding say. down. Go ahead, Harriet. Uh, one, I think uh, there are a lot of things that uh, the, the church addresses a lot of uh, things that actually affect our mental health. Things yeah. like we struggle with, things like uh, maybe guilt, which can contribute to mental health problems. It may not necessarily be mental illness. I remember I talked about the continuum. It talks about things Sorry, we are losing you. Uh, losing you. Grateful, forgiveness, love. Uh, there are so many things that are addressed. Am I still on? Yes, Am you I are. On? Yes, you are. Yes. So the church, the church does quite a lot, and in other places, actually, they looked up. They've done studies where they say, how can we incorporate the spiritual components? into the care of people with mental illness. There's something that uh, 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 Dr. Goreka talked about, uh, cognitive behavior therapy. It's about changing the way you think and the way you act. And there's a form that is called spiritually augmented cognitive behavior therapy, where it uses scripture and other things that I've talked about to incorporate, to, to treat mental illnesses like depression. So the church is doing mm. something, but we need also uh, to be able to see what works in our places. From personal experience, I've also realized that uh, when I'm going through challenges, I actually benefit from 
uh, talking to my pastors, and that has been very, very helpful. I, 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 I have a pastor who has walked the journey of, you know, dealing with challenges with me. Uh, he's called Pastor Bakimi. And, but I, I mean, a, a combination can work uh, of being able to see the pastor and being able to see, uh, I mean, a priest, because there are certain issues that may be spiritual in terms of the way one has, uh, ha, ha, has a mental health problem. The other question that has been coming up is about changing the name of the hospital. Uh, because it sounds like it comes. One thing we've noted that even on, they are still stigmatized. If it, if, I mean, going there is still stigmatized. Like when you talk about in Kenya, they talk about Mathari. And when you talk about Mathari, everyone relates it to mental illness. And it's not just the name, but the fact that it's Mathari. Yes, we lost you, uh, but I think that you had uh, made the point, um, and, and this is a continuing conversation, but maybe more importantly, the stigma around Butavika, the stigma around these places is not Butavika. It's the stigma around mental illness that we need to really deal with, and uh, I, I think that uh, that's what we need to face up with. Uh, friends, we must uh, really try and bring this to a close. Uh, it would be very helpful to get people post how useful this has been to you. Uh, so any comments on how this has been valuable, how you're going to take this forward. Uh, there is a question here, how can we get material from here that can be shared? Uh, and I think that's a challenge for us, uh, uh, Emmanuel and, and Andrew, uh, interface and focus to think, is there a way in which we can produce a basic material that can be shared, can be used uh, elsewhere. Uh, so this is a time as we are winding down. Uh, please share on the chat group what value this has been for you so we can be encouraged and what else you are going to do uh, going forward, um, uh, uh, how you're going to take this forward uh, in your own spaces. Uh, somebody says, uh, one of my pastors is a psychiatrist, however, I think that it is difficult, if not impossible, to stand in the pulpit and advocate what you don't understand. So maybe uh, if you, in your group of churches, maybe you need to do this session with your, uh, with your different pastors uh, so that the pastors themselves are aware uh, what this is. More education in our churches, more education in our different spaces. Uh, So Andrew, I think we should bring this to a close and I will be inviting you now, Andrew Mujugira, to be able to uh, bring this to a close. I really want to say thank you very, very much uh, to Harriet. Uh, you have been awesome. To Goreka, thank you very, very much. Uh, and Pastor Michael, you've really been a blessing. Uh, we will do a review of this session and maybe ask as to whether we need to do a more targeted uh, conversation on any of the aspects that emerged, because as you have noticed, though I have dealt with the broader questions, the broader issues, uh, then moving forward, maybe uh, we can be able to look at more specifics. But thank you very much to our facilitators. Thank you very much to all of you who've made your time and paid your money to get on this Zoom. And thank you very much to the uh, host, uh, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Luirica and the Africa Palliative Care Association. Thank you very much and God bless you. Uh, Andrew Mujugira, over to you. Thank you, Bishop, for moderating so well and for all our facilitators. One last appeal. All of us know families or people who are struggling with mental illness. Please reach out to them, people who have lost relatives or loved ones to suicide or have people that are mentally ill. They feel cut off. They feel isolated. Please reach out to them and love them. Try not to preach at them. Just walk alongside them and support them. They really need your support. God bless you all. Thank you for staying on and have a happy weekend. Over and out. God bless you.